Of all the economic concepts to grasp, the notion of cost is one of the most deceptively tricky. What are we really talking about when we talk about cost? Can we calculate it? Is it subjective or objective? These seem like very simple questions, but cost is not quite what it seems. Is cost even real beyond someone's feelings, beyond what is going on in a person's mind? Can we really say that cost is anything more than a mental event? Consider William Stanley Jevons's classic refutation of the labor theory of value. He says, the fact is that labor once spent has no influence on the future value of any article. It is gone and lost forever. In commerce, bygones will always be bygones. And we are always starting clear at each moment, judging the values of things with a view to future utility. Industry is entirely prospective, not retrospective. In the same way that labor once spent has no influence on the future value of any article, can we really say that money once spent has no influence on the future value of any article? The true pioneer on the topic of cost in the history of economic theory was Jevons's protege, Philip Wicksteed. First of all, consider any trade. For the trade to take place, both parties must make a profit within their own heads. In this case, for example, this man wants the gold coins more than he wants the pair of shoes, and the woman wants the pair of shoes more than she wants the gold coins. They exchange and both parties make a profit inside their own minds. It follows, says Wicksteed, that the satisfactions we secure are worth more than the price we pay for them. For the woman, she is willing to forgo all the other possible uses of the gold coins for the satisfaction she will secure from obtaining the shoes. Note that this way of looking at the exchange was a break with the classical economists and even from Jevons himself, who said that the ratio of the shoes and the gold coins is exactly one to one, so therefore we must say, at least at the moment of the exchange, that the value of the gold coins is equal to the value of the shoes. Now this is very slippery, but it should be clear that since value is subjective, it's not possible to say that the value of the shoes and the coins is the same. To the woman, the value of the shoes is greater than the coins, and to the man, vice versa. It's only from some magical third eye point of view that we can say that the one-to-one -one exchange ratio exists. Anyway, Wicksteed used this concept of foregoing all other possible uses when making a purchase like this, known as opportunity cost, to think about costs in general. Imagine, he says, a woman in a marketplace deciding how best to spend her money. If she decides to spend her money on the shoes, it isn't only all the other items she might have bought in the market that day that she has foregone, but all of the other possible goods and services she could have bought with that money instead. This mental event takes place inside the woman's mind in the marketplace, and it is the heart of the real meaning of cost. This is not only true of her, but of all purchases, even, for example, purchases by an entrepreneur capitalist buying producer goods. And here's where many modern economists, even highly respected ones, start to fall into error. They forget this fact about opportunity costs and start to imagine that the cost of production is built into the final price of the product in some way. Strictly speaking, it is not, and the idea that it is, is somewhat psychological. As Wicksteed goes on to say, what a thing has cost cannot determine its value, but what a thing will cost may determine whether or not it will be made. 
If it costs more to make than it is worth at the margin, it will not be made again in such large quantities. And if it is worth more at the margin than it has cost to make, it will be made in larger quantities. Thus, there is a constant tendency to equality between price and cost of production, but not because the latter determines the former. Here, Wicksteed is really describing the process of entrepreneurial forecasting. Those goods produced which sell below cost represent poor entrepreneurial judgments, and those goods which sell above cost, astute ones. Poor entrepreneurs will be purged from the market by going bust, while astute ones will face tougher competition as other entrepreneurs sniff the opportunity to make money in a proven market, thereby reducing the margin for profit and reducing the gap between the costs of production and the price. In an incredibly insightful passage, Wicksteed teases out an underappreciated distinction between the subjective valuation of the entrepreneur and the objective price determined by the market. Here, as in all markets, what each man is willing to pay for a thing is determined by its relative place on its own scale. What he actually has to pay, or go without it, by its relative place on the scales of others. There is equilibrium when these places coincide. Here, Wicksteed hints towards, but does not quite explicitly articulate, a quiet shift in the meaning of cost, the full significance of which was not recognised until 1960, when G. F. Thirlby pointed out, the subtle change in the meaning of cost from the valuation of his own displaced end product to the money input required for the selected course of action is a change leading to still yet another conception which carries with it the suspicion that it is to be regarded as a social cost. It resembles the first meaning of cost in that it is supposed to be an alternative value displaced, but differs from it in that it is not the entrepreneur's own valuation of his own displaced end product, but other people's, that is consumers' valuations of products which might have been produced by other entrepreneurs had they not been displaced. This is the difference between cost as experienced mentally by the entrepreneur and cost as registered by the accountant's ledger. The two are not the same. This is something on which it is worth pausing, especially right now, when many firms appear to be making very unusual decisions that seem adversely to affect their own bottom line. For example, remember when Gillette alienated a sizable portion of its customer base with its so-called woke advertising, despite taking an $8 billion loss, the CEO, Gary Coombe, claimed not to regret it and said that the loss of custom was a price worth paying, direct quote. If we take him at his word, for Gary Coombe, the prospect of getting people talking about toxic masculinity is worth more than $8 billion. Here is a clear case in which the personal valuations of the CEO and the valuations of the customers were completely different. This is a case of psychic profit, but what of psychic losses? Well, Wicksteed instinctively understood that losses were psychic rather than being measurable. In fact, he describes what modern behavioral economists would call the sunk cost fallacy. He notes the irrational enormament when some object hits our fancy and the pathetic attempts which we sometimes make to justify our choices post factum, and later how we try to make out that we value a thing which is really no better than rubbish to us because we paid a high price for it. There is a natural unwillingness, he says, in the human mind to face unpleasant facts, and having committed an error of judgment, we often shrink from recognizing the fact 
even though we thereby aggravate its results. In the same way, a commercial man who has made an error of judgment has produced things he cannot sell at cost price will be unwilling to recognize his error and will make a struggle to secure a price high enough to justify his action. I happened to see an example of this on television earlier today. Here in Britain we have a show called Dickinson's Real Deal. In it, members of the public take their household items to antique dealers who make them a cash offer. If the offer is accepted, they make a deal there and then. If they refuse the offer, the item is sold at an auction. And the thrill of the show is in seeing whether the member of the public made the right choice in selling to the dealer or in going to the auction. Somewhat standard daytime fare. Anyway, on this edition of the show, an old man bought uh, a vase in um, that he'd bought in the mid-90s for £60. The antiques dealer offered him £60 for it and he refused because, quote, that's what I paid for it. So she offered him £70 and he managed to talk her up to £75 and they made a deal. Notice how, in this transaction, the £60 that our man paid originally acted as a kind of anchor in his mind. He wasn't happy to sell it below that price. In his own mind, he made a £15 profit on it. But of course, in actuality, if you adjust for inflation, the price he paid back in 1995 for it was more like £113. So did our chap make a profit or a loss? Trying to take a purely objective third-eye accountant point of view, we'd say in real money terms he sold it for less than he paid for it. However, the fact he was willing to part with the vase suggests that he preferred the £75 to keeping it, so it's a profit in his own mind. Now were this old man running a business along these sorts of lines, he'd end up going bust in the long run. That's because entrepreneurs, strictly speaking, aren't dealing in their own valuations of products, but rather trying to guess the valuations of everyone else. He has to try to guess what consumers want. Now let's pretend old money bags here went all in on producing shoes. He spent 1,000 gold pieces on getting the labour, the leather, renting the production facilities and so on. This 1,000 gold pieces, strictly speaking, is spent. After he spent this money, it exists only in his own mind and in the accountant's ledger. These shoes aren't worth 1,000 gold pieces. The fact our man has spent this money making them is completely immaterial. The only person in the world who cares about this figure is the entrepreneur here. If he was completely dispassionate, strictly speaking, he should see that 1,000 number as money foregone, a cost already paid, money lost forever. If no one else at all wants these shoes, their market value is zero. At best, the entrepreneur might process it, mentally this is, as a gamble. Now he has to put those shoes on the market to see if his gamble is going to pay off. How many women are going to pay the three gold pieces he's charging? He's just guessed that this woman is willing to pay that price. Is he right? Well, that's the market. If he wants to try to claw back the thousand gold pieces he spent, he needs to sell at least 334 shoes at this three gold piece price that he's worked out. Then beyond that, any further shoes he sells at any price makes him additional money beyond what he originally paid. In the event, he can only sell 300 for three, he shifts an additional 400 for two, then he sells off the rest at one, which is what he paid for them originally. He made 2,000 gold pieces, so he doubled his original investment. Now our chap processes this additional money, mentally this is, as profit, but in reality what he's done is correctly guessed that a certain number of people would be prepared to buy those shoes at that price and then gambled on that being the case. If he continually guesses right, 
he continues to make more money and if he gets it wrong as in this scenario he will in the end run out of money and this is where so many people including economists run into trouble when they start claiming that the cost of production determines the price of the final good as we've seen it does not really determine the price of the final good so remember in economics cost is always an opportunity cost cost is always foregone cost is experienced as a mental event cost has no influence on future value except as it influences the seller's mental state and willingness to sell now get out